Uh, I have to be perfectly honest and say that when I was uh, first asked to speak at this event, I burst out laughing um, because, uh, as you can see, I don't exactly embody the theme of health uh, or the uh, benefits of a healthy diet and lots of exercise, but that was before I realized uh, just how broadly the organizers of this event were defining the theme of health. So although I'm going to confine my remarks this afternoon to the contemporary United States, I'm also going to speak in very broad terms about what defines a healthy culture. As you'll see, diet and exercise do in fact play a role, uh, but not in the conventional sense. Now I'd like to begin by invoking the notion of the body politic and its health. This of course is a familiar move in the American context, as we can see if we go back to 1950 and quote from an editorial that J. Edgar Hoover wrote for the American Medical Association. In an article called Let's Keep America Healthy, Hoover speaks of the way in which, and this is the quote, communist germs spawned in the swamps of iniquity and terror have blotted out the sunshine of free thought, independent research, and unfettered inquiry. Now, the irony, of course, of someone like J. Edgar Hoover talking about the suppression of freedom of thought is too obvious to linger over. Instead, uh, let me make a comparison between Hoover's remarks and the atmosphere in this country in the weeks, months, and years after 9-11. Um, when uh, I think uh, you can see a similarity between what Hoover talks about and the Islamophobia that was rife in this country during that period when Muslims uh, replaced communists as the uh, number one boogeyman, a source of paranoid anxiety about America being invaded um, by terrorist cells. Now, what these two examples have in common, of course, is the sense that the threat to America comes from outside, the threat to the health of our country. And um, in particular, it takes the form of the invasion of terrorist cells. My emphasis this afternoon is quite different. Instead of projecting the source of sickness onto a threatening other, whether it be a communist or a Muslim or another figure, um, and that figure who in turn can be projected outside of an implicitly pure United States, I want to encourage all of us to take a long, hard look in the mirror and focus on problems that are internal to the US, problems that we cannot project onto anyone or anything else. To put it another way, before we can talk about what defines a healthy culture, we have to talk about what ails us, the ways in which our body politic is indeed sick. For example, we cannot possibly have a healthy culture when the US spends more on defense than all the other nations of the world combined. Between 1998 and 2011, military spending in this country doubled, reaching more than $700 billion a year, more in adjusted dollars than at any time since the Allies were fighting the Axis powers in World War II. Even though we have now officially withdrawn from Iraq and are apparently winding down in Afghanistan, US Special Operations Forces are currently conducting operations in more than 70 countries around the globe, suggesting that we will continue to wage a low intensity form of warfare for many years to come. The military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned us about in his farewell speech in 1961 has come to pass with a vengeance, dominating our economy to an extent and for a length of time that even Eisenhower could not possibly have imagined. Similarly, we cannot possibly have a healthy culture when American drone strikes continue to kill civilians. Since 2004, for example, the Bush and Obama administrations have carried out hundreds of drone strikes in Northwest Pakistan alone. Exact figures on casualties are very difficult to come across because these operations are shrouded in such secrecy. But the Bureau of Investigative Journalism found that since 2004, between 391 
and 780 civilians were killed out of a total of between 1,658 and 2,597 deaths, and that 160 children were included among those deaths. The Bureau also revealed that since President Obama took office, at least 50 civilians have been killed in follow-up strikes when they had gone to help victims, and more than 20 civilians have been killed in deliberate strikes on funerals and mourners, tactics that have been condemned by legal experts. As we all know, there's been a lot of justified concern recently about whether US citizens living abroad could or should be legitimate targets of drone strikes. But are we really saying that the life of an American citizen should ever be considered more valuable than the life of a Pakistani child? If we are, then we are a sick culture indeed. We cannot possibly have a healthy culture when 1% of Americans own 40% of the nation's wealth, when millions of Americans who work full-time jobs cannot make ends meet because a minimum wage is very different from a living wage, when banks are considered too big to fail, but ordinary homeowners are considered too, too small to protect, and so they lose everything. And when in 2010, 49 million Americans, including more than 16 million children, lived in households that couldn't afford enough food. That means that one in six Americans and one in five American children lived in homes that directly face or are on the brink of hunger. Something is seriously wrong with the health of this country when the top, when the top 1% are taking in more than 20, more, uh, a bigger share of the nation's income than at any time since the 1920s. And yet, according to the New York City Hunger Coalition, that city's emergency food providers, organizations like food pantries, soup kitchens, brown bag programs, experienced a 20% increase in the need for their services in a single year, with the biggest share of that increase coming from families with children. And finally, we cannot possibly have a healthy culture when we make it both essential for young people to attend college in order to get anywhere in life, and yet at the same time, we make college so expensive that either those people cannot attend at all, or they attend and in the process accumulate so much debt that their life choices are determined by the existence of that debt. According to linguist and political activist Noam Chomsky, and this is a quote, Students who acquire large debts, are putting themselves through school, are unlikely to think about change in society. When you trap people in a system of debt, this makes them efficient components of the consumer economy. Now obviously I could continue to multiply examples, but I trust that my main point is clear. Our priorities as a culture are so skewed toward aggression toward others, selfish individualism, and the acquisition of wealth over the common good, that it seems like an impossible task to develop a more healthy culture. Moreover, what I take from the Chomsky quote I just read is that for many Americans, this situation is perfectly fine. In other words, for some people, everything I've said so far would not be regarded as signs of sickness, but rather as signs of health, as signs that the system is working just as it's supposed to. And you know what? They're right. The things that I've described so far are not anomalies or breakdowns in the system. Rather, they are examples of what the Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek has called objective violence, which he describes as a normally invisible type of violence that represents the smooth, everyday functioning of the capitalist system. Zizek compares this type of violence to what he calls subjective violence, which is the type of violence we see on our TV screens and computers every single day. These are acts of spectacularly visible violence committed by individuals that capture our attention for a moment, and then they're gone. The subjective violence is exemplified by the recent shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. This tragic event illustrates the out-of-control 
gun culture that permeates this country, a gun culture that is another major threat to the health of our society. Thanks to the National Rifle Association and its supporters, efforts toward gun control are being weakened every day. And I wouldn't be surprised if the ultimate outcome of an event as horrific as the Newtown shootings would be precisely nothing. In other words, the continuation of the status quo. All of the problems I've mentioned this afternoon could be addressed easily. Cut military spending. Suspend drone strikes immediately and indefinitely. Increase tax rates on the wealthiest Americans. Pay for students to attend college. Increase regulation of the financial services industry. Pass living wage legislation. Oh, and while we're at it, let's institute campaign finance reform, including the repeal of Citizens United so that our democratic process is not for sale to corporations. We all know what needs to be done, but we also all know why it won't happen. Because too few people with too much money and too much influence is the very definition of a sick culture. So, what can be done? If we're looking to build a healthy culture, how do we do it? First, let me define what I mean by culture. To quote the English critic, Raymond Williams, culture is a whole way of life. By that I mean culture describes all the ways in which we live in the world, experience it, and try to make it responsive to our needs by expressing our hopes, desires, and ambitions. It includes the creative activities that we usually associate with the arts and humanities, but it also includes forms of labor the work of expressing ourselves through our everyday activities. Even though I'm going to conclude by making some specific suggestions about how we can build a healthy culture, I want us to keep this very broad definition in mind. In some ways, I am tempted to follow Bertolt Brecht's famous dictum, food first, then ethics, which I take to mean that one cannot possibly have a healthy culture when people are hungry. But I also want to emphasize that culture is not a luxury. It is a necessity just as much as food, clothing, and shelter. And a healthy culture should make this necessity available to everyone. That's why my first key word in defining a healthy culture is access. I have a friend who's a public school art teacher. And two years ago, she lost her job because of cuts in uh, art instruction in her school district. And since then, she's been unable to find another job for the same reason. Art and music should be considered just as essential for our kids as any other aspect of their school day, as crucial as science, math, language arts, lunch, and recess. If we're gonna build a healthy culture, we need to give everyone access to the means to make and appreciate culture from as early an age as possible. My second key word is implied by my first, and that is participation. Some people persist in seeing consumers as passive sheep who can be led by the nose by the culture industries in whatever direction those industries want them to go. Anyone who's ever been to a hockey game, anyone who's ever been to a movie theater and has heard people talk back to the screen. Anyone who's ever been to any cultural event at all will know that consumption is not a passive activity. It is a passionately creative activity in and of itself. But with that said, in order to have a healthy culture, it is essential to give people the opportunity to create culture as well as to consume it. Now, everyone will have their own favorite examples of organizations that make this possible. I think, for example, of the Western New York Book Art Center in downtown Buffalo that offers workshops in screen printing, paper making, book binding, et cetera, 
I also think of an organization like Squeaky Wheel Buffalo Media Resources on Main Street in Buffalo, which is a, a grassroots, artist-run, and nonprofit media art center that promotes and supports film, video, digital, audio, and computer art by both artists and community members. These organizations do invaluable work in our communities by building a healthy culture from the ground up. And I think that's the only way to do it. Just as trickle-down economics is nonsense, so is trickle-down culture, except when it comes to the provision of funding. And that's why my third key word that defines a healthy culture would be structure. Despite the excellent work that organizations like Squeaky Wheel do, they spend way too much time and effort looking for funding when local, state, and national government should all be funding these organizations so that they can do the work they need to do. Instead, just the opposite is happening. Just as art and music programs are being cut from our public schools, we all know that these cultural organizations are the first on the chopping block when spending cuts need to be made. We need to make a structural commitment to providing adequate funding for these organizations. Without them, it's impossible for us to have a healthy culture. My fourth and final key word is also implied by what I've said so far, and that word is diversity. To go back for a moment to my earlier point about defense spending and drone strikes being signs of a sick culture, the journalist Glenn Greenwald has recently argued, and this is a quote, it's not difficult to induce a population to avert its eyes from the victims of the violence they support. We all like to believe that we're good and peaceful people. Greenwald goes on to say that the American media makes it easier for us to avert our eyes by rendering the victims of that violence largely silent and invisible. This is why we need diversity in our culture. A diversity of perspectives produced by a diversity of organizations enabling our culture to have what I regard as the ultimate foundation of health, and that is free and open debate. There are certain things that we can do to promote this diversity, and they would include breaking up the media conglomerates that currently dominate media in this country. A situation such as it exists now in the US where fewer and fewer individuals and corporations control greater and greater parts of the mass media cannot possibly be healthy for our culture. But as important as diversifying media ownership is, I repeat my earlier claim, a healthy culture is ultimately developed from the ground up. Diversifying and properly funding local organizations of the kind I described earlier is the best way to ensure long-term health. So, what part do diet and exercise play in this? Yes, they are important, but as I said at the start, not in the conventional sense. If we diversify our media diet by changing some structural features of our media, then we can exercise our right to be productive and informed citizens by, giving, by being given the means, the access to the means of participating in the growing and shaping of a healthy culture. This is a future that we all deserve and we can make it happen. Thank you for your time.